So today we're back in chapter two, talking about the two grid algorithm. So I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, uh, refreshers for you guys. We're in the middle of defining what is the two grid operator, but let me uh, go back and uh, recall uh, what what some of the, the the language that we're using in describing these two grid operators. I changed this slide around just a little bit. Most other slides in this chapter aren't changed at all, but uh, notice the, the couple of changes here. So whenever we define these two matrices, one of which is going to be our level one or fine grid stiffness matrix, and the other one is going to be the coarse grid stiffness matrix, the only thing that we really care about is that they're both SPD, symmetric positive definite. And the fine grid operator, the fine grid stiffness matrix, is an SPD matrix which has more rows and columns, it has to be square of course, than the coarse grid version, which is also SPD but has fewer rows and columns. Okay, so the one with more is going to be labeled N1, the one with less is going to be labeled with N0. And another way, uh, of course there's no grids yet. Uh, lying around. So what we could mean here is just uh, a level one stiffness matrix, or a, and by level one, we just mean a stiffness matrix with relatively more rows and columns, and a level zero stiffness matrix, one which has relatively fewer rows and columns. Otherwise, we don't really care what the structure of these matrices are, just that they're SPD, and one has uh, more rows and columns than the other. Okay, so that's the important part there. Uh, the matrix R0 is called um, a restriction matrix if it's full rank and it's non-square having N zero rows and N one columns. So it has fewer rows than it has columns. And if it, if it has this structure, we're gonna call that a restriction matrix. And a prolongation matrix is just the opposite. If it's a full rank matrix with N one rows and N zero rows, uh, N0 columns, then we're going to call that a prolongation matrix. And we're only going to treat a special case um, by a following definition, namely whenever uh, the prolongation and restriction are related through transposition. Uh, we're going to, that's going to be a special case for us, but it's going to be the case most of the time. Uh, and, and so we call that the balanced restriction prolongation pair. So, or in other words, we say we have a balanced prolongation restriction pair if they're related through transposition. Now, we're going to come up with cases later, especially in chapter seven, where this is not the uh, case. And uh, but for the most part, it 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 is always going to be um, the thing we're going to assume. That is, they come in these pairs where the prolongation is just equal to the transposition of the or the transpose of the restriction. Now, remember I said, we don't really care uh, if there's any relationship between the coarse grid stiffness matrix and the fine grid stiffness matrix. So here's the coarse grid, there's the fine grid, except uh, we want to make a special um, definition for the case where they uh, satisfy the following relationship. If A0 is equal to RAP, then we're going to say that the Galerkin condition is satisfied. This one is an important condition in multigrid methodology, and so we're going to give it its uh, its due special status. That's what we refer to as the A0 matrix satisfies the Galerkin condition if and only if A0 is equal to R A1P, okay, the wrap condition. Okay, so those are uh, just a reminder of things we learned last time. This is kind of the a visualization of the structure of the Galerkin condition. Whenever A0 is equal to R times A times P, um, keeping in mind in this case, uh, we're gonna demand usually that R and uh, P are related through uh, this balancing where R0 is equal to P0 transpose, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, just uh, basically you can always assume that that's the case unless I say otherwise. And I'm going to say otherwise only in chapter, only when we get to chapter seven. Otherwise, just assume this. So we proved this little result, namely that says that if A naught is related to 
um, is related by equation one, and this is a typo here. This should be, and equation one was this condition. So if A naught is related to A1 through this condition, then it has to be that A naught is equal to an SPD matrix. So we proved that last time. All right, now let's get on to this definition of the two grid operator. So we need to solve this problem. A1, U1 equals F1. And we're going to give this a special designation. This is the exact solution of this uh, symmetric positive definite system of equations. So it's the level one or the fine grid version of the problem that we're really interested in solving. So where does this coarse grid and this coarse uh, stiffness matrix show up? Well, it shows up in the definition of this two-grid operator, which we're about to define. And we're going to use a two-grid operator to, to define an iteration sequence like this. Pretty, pretty standard. So if I put in the last guy, the last approximation, we're going to generate a new approximation by applying this thing called the two-grid operator. So I have to define that, and that's what we were in the middle of doing last time. The two grid operator has, let's see, did I update this? Yes, good. So the two grid operator um, has an input, which is basically the F, and a second input, which is basically, or two inputs, I should say. The first one is the F or the right hand side. And then the other one is whatever initial condition you want to put in for the iteration. Now, I'm going to use uh, the special notation here. Uh, where I um, emphasize the fact that this operation or this operator is defined in three stages, where I'm going to think about the initial condition of the iteration as being u superscript zero with parentheses around the zero. And then I'm going to update that in three stages. So I'm going to update it first in the pre-smoothing stage, then in the coarse grid correction, and then finally in the post-smoothing stage. And that that output is going to be the output or the definition of the two grid operator. All right, last time we defined this smoothing operation. Now, smoothing is nothing more than picking a general linear iterative scheme, GLIS. And remember, GLIS is defined whenever I tell you what is the iterator matrix. And in this case, we're going to define the iterator matrix as this thing called S1. And that makes its appearance right here. So there's, that's nothing more or less than applying a general linear iterative scheme with the same B matrix, the same iterator matrix, and it's going to be applied M1 times. Okay, so we're going to load it with whatever you give me as the initial guess. I'm going to load this as my um, into sort of a memory, and then I'm going to update this m1 times, and after I'm done m updating that m1 times, I'm going to copy that into this final output, which is the final output of the first stage of this two-grid operator. And it's nothing more or less than applying a GLIS m1 times. Okay, So just do m1 iterations of the GLIS method, and that's the output of the pre-smoothing stage. Now, why do I call it smoothing or pre-smoothing? That is going to be discussed in a little bit. Okay. So the, this concept of smoothing is um, has to do with how this transforms the error, uh, and so it's going to turn it's going to do something called smoothing the error, and that's why it's going to be called smoothing step. So I've got a question in um, chat. So should it be technically m one minus one times? I think it's uh, I think it's exactly m one times. So let's count. So if I have, so should be, should maybe this should be M1. So let's see, the what's the first step? So whenever sigma is equal to one, I'm using the zeroth one, right? So this will be one zero, or actually, no, let's see, this should be zero. That's yeah, a, you that's a typo. A zero. Yeah. yeah, that's a typo. So, that should be zero, and uh, yeah, it's it's actually will be done m one times exactly, but the first time we apply it, that sigma should be a zero, and the last time we apply it, this one is correct. So we just need to update that in the in the 
So this should be wrong probably in the um, in the lecture notes and in the slides. So we'll, we'll make sure to correct that. Exactly M1 times. Okay. Now we're going to go on to the course grid correction. So this one last time I was trying to argue that, well, after we compute the smoothing step, then we can compute this thing called the residual. And if I could precisely calculate this thing, okay, what would this object be here? This is the exact error that I incur from doing that smoothing operation. So I do the smoothing M1 times, and then I can compute and, and of course, that's the finish or the completion of stage one. Then I can compute this thing called the residual. Well, if I compute this thing called the residual, and then I solve this thing called the error equation. Remember, the residual and the error satisfy a um, error residual relationship. If I solve this equation called the error equation, then I can compute the true solution. Right, because the true solution would just be the error. True solution is nothing more than the error plus whatever guess, whatever our best guess was previously. Just add that onto the error and you get the, the true solution. So if I knew what this E11 was, I could solve this problem. It's it's an equivalent problem, okay? It tells me exactly uh, something equivalent about the problem. Now, why do I recast it in this light? Well, I told you, it turns out that whenever I apply uh, a general linear iterative scheme, it smooths something, smooths something called the error. So it makes the error look a little bit better in a certain sense. And we're going to get to that later on uh, when we when we're in the next chapter, we're going to really hammer this. We're going to try to hammer this home. But in any case, the error might become a little bit nicer and might be easier to deal with, whatever. Uh, so we're arguing that we can solve this equivalent equation in order to get the error and then get the true solution from it. Now, but what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is that we have to solve an equation which is just as hard as the orig original problem, and we don't want to do that. It's too expensive. However, what we're going to say to ourselves is, well, um, I can't solve that problem. It might be too expensive, but suppose I'm working on a course grid where I, uh, where the problem looks more or less the same as on the fine grid, except that you know we're we're dealing with fewer degrees of freedom. Suppose I can work on the course grid. I can solve this problem. Well, then maybe, just maybe, this thing I get out in the end, this error, quote unquote, might be kind of a good enough approximation of this guy. So that's the idea. But now I have to make a relationship between this residual and whatever this thing is. Okay, this thing which looks like or might look like a residual. So that's the idea of this two grid operator. Um, this step called the coarse grid correction is where I'm going to get an approximation of the error, but not on the original fine grid. I'm going to get an approximation of the error on the coarse grid. Okay, so this problem should be cheaper to solve. I should be able to just invert this matrix and solve it. And maybe it, 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 the cost of this inversion is half the cost or a quarter of the cost of the uh, of this problem. So that's going to be the kind of idea that we're going to roll with. Now, here's how I'm going to compute this object, which I'm going to say is an approximation of the residual, but on the coarse grid. Let's let's go with this for a second. So I'm going to compute the coarse or the fine grid residual. So that is the exact residual. And if I would were to solve this problem, I would get the exact error, but that's ex too expensive. So I'm going to take this residual and I'm going to push it down into the coarse grid using the restriction operator. Remember, restriction takes fine level information and pushes it down into the coarse grid. Now I'm going to 
do what I said I was going to do before. I'm going to solve this problem exactly, but I'm not going to call this the, this is too evocative. So I'm going to call this object here the Q01E. So this is going to be some version of an error, not really the correct error that I'm looking for. So push the residual down to the coarse grid using the restriction. And then I'm going to exactly solve. So what this part is here, I'm going to exactly solve this equation. Right? And I'm, I'm just going to do it in a very um, straightforward manner. Just multiply both sides by the inverse of a naught. Okay, so the inverse goes over, and that's how I define this guy. Now, this is not the error that I want. Okay, so this is not the error that I want, but maybe, hopefully, it's a good approximation of the error. And I'm going to explain why this is true in Chapter 3. So, But for right now, you just have to roll with it that maybe this is a good approximation of the error. And that's what all of multigrid is going to be about, trying to prove that that's good enough. All right, so this is my approximation of the error, but on the coarse grid, obtained by solving the coarse grid problem exactly. All right, now I'm going to normally, in multigrid, I don't get this exact computation. I get something approximating it. And so that's what is going to usually be in this vector here, Q01. Not the exact, but some approximation of it. Right now, I have exactly that. So there's nothing really going on in this update here. It's just really a copy update. Now, I'm going to take that vector, and that's what's called the coarse grid correction. And I'm going to push it up to the fine grid through prolongation. Remember, prolongation moves information from the coarse grid to the fine grid. So take the prolongation operator, the prolongation matrix, push this guy up. And remember now, I'm still thinking this should be a nice approximation of my error. And now it's even of the right size because it's on the fine grid. So the idea here is Q1, 1. That guy should be an approximation of the thing I really wish I had, which is the true error. And now I'm going to do what I said you could do before. If you had the real error and you added the true solution or the current um, iterate onto it, well, then that's something uh, that would be close to the true. The Well, let's see. Let me back up. So if I have the true error and I add on the current iterate to it, you get exactly the, the true solution. If I have something approximating the true error and I add the current iterate to it, then I get something approximating something approximating the true solution. So that's where this coarse grid correction update comes from. This U12 is precisely that. It's my current iterate for obtained from the smoothing step. And I'm going to add to the this thing called the coarse grid correction. That something is really hopefully some good approximation. And we're going to we're going to make this rigorous by doing some Fourier analysis in the next chapter and some other types of analysis later on. That something should be a pretty good approximation to the true error, which is what we want. Now, um, to finish up the step on this two grid operator, once I have this coarse grid corrected solution, I'm going to smooth that guy by doing uh, M2 post smoothing steps. And in this case, I got it right because this one starts out with sigma uh, equal to zero and stops with sigma equals to M2. So this one is M2 um, applications of a simple uh, general linear iterative process. So the GLIS. But this time, the B matrix, the iterator, is going to be taken as S1 transpose. Not S1, but S1 transpose. And this it does one th uh, a nice thing that's going to be important to us later on. It symmetrizes this process. So it's... Uh, it symmetrizes this process by, instead of using S1, we're going to use S1 transpose. But otherwise, it's just M2 applications of some general linear iterative scheme like we've had before. Namely, it's going to be something like uh, weighted Jacobi or Jacobi or gauss seidel or maybe Richardson smoother. Okay, 
And we call it a smoother in these applications because it's going to do something nice to the error. In particular, it's going to smooth out the error. Now, smoothing out the error has an, an important um, plays an important role because if the error becomes smooth after pre or post smoothing, then when I try to push that error down to or realize that error on a coarse grid, it's well approximated on the coarse grid because coarse grids can approximate well things that are smooth. And we're going to talk about why this is so when we get along, get on to uh, chapter uh, three and four and so on. Now, this element here has a special name, this Q01. It's called the two-grid coarse grid correction. And this element here, Q1E, sorry, Q01E is called the exact coarse grid correction. Now, in multi-grid, we're not going to have an exact coarse grid correction, only, in a, only this approximation of it. They won't be the same. The matrix S1 is called the smoothing operator or the smoothing matrix. And notice that that's used twice. Only the second application in the post-smoothing, it's used with the transpose. And that does something called symmetrizing this process. All right, so that's all the key features of this thing called the two-grid uh, operator. And we're going to use that in a very simple way to define something called the two-grid algorithm. Now, in the multi-grid... Question. Yeah, question. Um... So just to clarify, the Q the Q zero or the Q the Q is an approximation of the error in the coarse grid. Correct. Okay. It's not it's not an approximation of the residual. Correct. That's right. It's not an approximation of the residual because it's gotten by solving an error residual equation like this. Yes. Okay. So that means it's really sol it solves this equation. You can see it's not equal to the residual. It's in this role of something which looks like an error. Remember the error, we always have this uh, dual problem where it, whether it's the one grid or the zero grid, the coarse grid or the fine grid, the error and the residual always satisfy that sort of relationship. Okay, and we can put whatever we want here, L, 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 and we can put whatever we want here, M. Um, okay, but they always sat satisfy that sort of uh, that sort of equation. Now, um, we don't really have something called the true residual on the coarse grid, and we don't therefore have something called the error on the coarse grid, but only these kind of approximations of them. All right, so this object here is something which plays the role of an error or an approximation thereof in two grid. We set it exactly equal to this exact inversion problem solution right here. Okay. They're exactly equal. But in multi grid, they're not going to be the same. They're going to only be an approximation. Okay. Because we're going to reason that in multi grid setting, even this problem might be expensive for us. And so we're going to keep wanting to coarsen this, um, uh, our, our, our perspective until we get down to a problem which is really truly inexpensive. Um, so now here's a bit of confusion. This element Q11 is also often referred to as the coarse grid correction. So sometimes it's unclear whether we should re refer to this guy or this guy as the coarse grid correction. And what I'll usually do is I'll, I won't be clear about which one is truly the coarse grid correction. Um, this one is actually lives on the coarse grid, but this version of the coarse grid correction actually lives on the fine grid because we're taking the prolongation operator and pushing that coarse grid information up to the fine grid. Okay, so that's just a little point of um, um, ambiguity, which I want to, to mention. So both of them are kind of, could be called the coarse grid correction. Um, this one you might want to call the fine grid correction, but that that uh, that nomenclature hasn't really stuck. So we're just going to use coarse grid correction to define both of them, and and hopefully it's clear which one is which, which one lives on the coarse grid, and which one really lives on the fine grid according to their level number, the, these subscripts. Okay, um, 
And then the final remark I want to make is that we use two uh, smoothing operations, but they use the same iterator matrix. One is the pre-smoothing step, and that uses the iteration matrix S1. The post-smoothing step uses the iteration matrix S1 transpose. And again, that is a symmetrization process. Okay, that is so what we can symmetrize this algorithm. Now, to define this algorithm, all you need are these two numbers because they're only the they're only two free parameters. I suppose you could also say uh, you also need to say what S1 you're using, what what iterator matrix. And then you're going to specify M1 and M2. That's the number of pre-smoothing or post-smoothing steps. So once those are kind of out of the way and defined, um, then we have this thing called the two grid operator. So initially you put in this true right-hand side F and uh, at some stage you're gonna put in U1K and that's just what iteration you're currently at. And we're gonna update that iteration by applying this two grid operator, which happens in this three stage process. So two grid happens in three stages. Okay, so don't let that confuse you. Two grids, three stages. Um, three stages are pre-smoothing, coarse grid correction, and post-smoothing. So this defines our generic two-grid algorithm. That's it. That's the whole thing. And hopefully it's a good algorithm for solving or at least approximating this uh, true solution. Okay, the true solution for this problem. The two-grid algorithm is what we call one-sided. If M1 is greater than or equal to one, and M2 is equal to zero. Now it's gonna turn out, you have to show, you're always gonna to need to do some level of smoothing. Um, we can't leave both of these equal to zero. Otherwise we get a, uh, an, an, an algorithm which doesn't converge. On the other hand, we could do smoothing and only do smoothing, and that will converge because we know that general linear iterative schemes do converge. The problem is they just converge a bit too slowly to be practical. And I'm gonna discuss why this is so in chapter three as well. We do need some smoothing, but it's gonna turn out we don't actually need a lot of smoothing because the coarse grid correction step, if we do things right, is gonna take a huge chunk out of the error and it's gonna make the convergence of an otherwise slow algorithm, namely these general linear iterative schemes, converge very rapidly. And therefore we say that these two grid algorithms and the multi-grid algorithm that's gonna replace it are what we call accelerators for uh, general linear iterative schemes. So the TG is an accelerator. Is that two L's or one L? I don't remember. Is an accelerator for general linear iterative schemes. So. Your general linear iterative scheme is whatever smoothing method you're going to use. And the two grid method becomes then an accelerator for making that run really fast. And the big breakthrough here is this thing called the coarse grid correction. Okay, so the new, the new thing is the coarse grid correction. So that's the new technology that's being introduced here with um, with the two-grid algorithm. And later on, when we talk about multi-grid algorithm, we're going to take this coarse grid correction idea to the next level, I suppose. All right, so I want to examine what this coarse grid correction looks like in a very special, but also kind of trivial case. Um, it's allowed by our definition. Um, but it just becomes kind of a trivial case, as you'll see. So here's what I'm gonna do. Suppose that we take the R matrix to be exactly equal to the, the N1 by N1 identity matrix. And let's suppose that the P matrix, um, I forgot to say this, but the P matrix is equal to the R transpose. And of course, that's always, that's always gonna be understood unless we say so otherwise. Suppose that uh, A naught satisfies the Galerkin condition. In other words, it's given by the wrap condition. So what do we have in this case? Well, these are just identity matrix. So the coarse grid matrix in this case, this very stupid case, turns out to be exactly equal to 
the fine grid stiffness matrix. And it's stupid because it's going, you're going to see that it doesn't make the algorithm run any faster, but it's going to explain a little bit what's going on with this coarse grid correction. So let's carry out the steps. The first thing we do is after smoothing, we calculate a residual. That's just the standard residual. Now we're going to push that residual down to the coarse grid. But the coarse grid is just the same as the fine grid because the restriction and prolongation uh, operators are just the identity operators. So when we push this guy down to the coarse grid, it's really just the same as the thing on the fine grid. So this is still the true residual. And now what happens when we solve this problem for the coarse grid correction? And we're going to do it in this exact way that, um, that the two grid says, says to do it. Well, that is just going to be remembering that the coarse grid stiffness matrix is really the same as the fine grid, and the coarse grid residual is really the same as the fine grid residual. Well, that is just the same as solving for the true error on the fine grid. So this coarse grid correction really is just the fine grid error. And when we push it back up to the fine grid, of course, P0 is just equal to, uh, again, the identity matrix. So when it comes all the way up to the fine grid, it's just nothing more than or less than the uh, the true error on the fine grid, E11. So when I add that onto the current iterate, uh, current iterate or the current stage that I've just computed after pre-smoothing, well, we get uh, this minus that, and we just get the true solution popping out. So that means that, well, if I do it this way, then I would just do one smoothing step, and after one coarse grid correction, I would have exactly the true solution. I wouldn't have to go uh, on any further. I wouldn't have to do the post-smoothing operation because I would have a fixed point to that operation anyway. Nothing would happen. So this is kind of um, a silly um, uh, observation of what happens whenever the prolongation and the restrictions are just the identity. Um, but in that case, nothing happens. But it's supposed to be evocative. So it's supposed to say, uh, well, okay, suppose that my coarse grid problem and fine grid problem are really different, but they're highly connected and highly related. Well, in that case, uh, my prolongation and restriction operators aren't going to be the identity, but they're going to be something which acts like an identity, pretty much. And in that case, I'm hoping that when I do this computation, it really does give me something which is, though not equal, will give me something which is a very good approximation of the true error. Again, so that's supposed to explain or be evocative of why we do what we do uh, in computing this thing called the coarse grid correction. It's supposed to be a very good approximation of the true error. Now, in the two grid algorithm, of course, they're not the same. Um, and they don't even live on the same grids, right? Because this lives on the coarse grid, this lives on the fine grid. You can't even compare the two things. But the idea is hopefully the prolongation of that coarse grid correction up onto the fine grid gives us something which is a good approximation of the error. And so that's what we're hoping. Now it's gonna turn out there's gonna be some requirements there, namely that this error that we start with or the, the residual that we start with, the error uh, that we started with, should be what we call smooth. And that's what the smoothers are for. So we're going to explain what we mean later. What, you know, what is that property and how, how can we check it, make sure that it, ha that, that it holds. Okay, so we've defined the, um, the coarse and the fine grid stiffness matrices. We defined this thing called the prolongation matrix and the restriction matrix. And we've defined what we mean by having these prolongation restrictions in balance. That's going to be the usual assumption. So I'm going to stop saying that they're balanced. And uh, we described something called the Galerkin condition. And we, uh, we made that definition. So the Galerkin condition means that the coarse grid stiffness matrix is related to the fine grid through the wrap condition. And then finally, we described what we mean by the two grid operator. So next thing I want to do is define for our theory what we call the coarse grid Ritz projection, the coarse grid Ritz projection operator. So this operator comes about uh, in, in our analysis, or especially our error analysis. And so we need to give it a name. And uh, so here's the name. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is define this thing, this matrix here. 
pi zero matrix. So pi zero is going to be the inverse of A zero times the restriction matrix times the A1 matrix. So let's look at this in terms of, you know, does it even make sense? The first thing I have to check is, is it compatible for multiplication? So it's compatible for multiplication if the number of columns and the number of rows here match up, they do. And the same number of columns and number of rows here have to match up, they do. So this product turns out to be, this is a square matrix, non-square, square. The product comes out to be N0 by N1. So it has um, only a few uh, rows and it has a lot of columns, right? So this matrix looks like that. Okay, a rectangle laying on its side. Okay, short and fat. And the thing that I want to define called the coarse grid rich projection matrix, we're just going to apply one more uh, restriction, or actually it's the restriction champ transpose. So this guy is actually the prolongation operator applied to this operator pi zero. And that gives us what's called the pi one tilde operator. That's what's called the coarse grid rich projection matrix. Now that matrix turns out to be square because um, this matrix here is going to be N1 by N0. And so when I apply it to this one, it's going to be N1 by N1, so square. And then we can ask, well, is this matrix invertible? You know, what good is this matrix? Where does it come into play? And is it useful? Well, it turns out this one makes an appearance when we start talking about the error associated to the two grid algorithm. And so we want to show where and how this matrix shows up on the scene in the description of the two grid, uh, the error matrix for the two grid operator. Now, um, Whenever you call something a projection matrix, it really had ought to satisfy a projection condition. And what do we mean by a projection condition? Well, a projection matrix by definition is really a matrix that when you multiply it by itself, um, you get the same matrix back. So P squared is equal to P. So does this matrix satisfy that? Turns out it does. As long as A0 satisfies the Glurkin condition, then pi one tilde, pi one tilde is equal to just pi one tilde. In other words, this matrix, when you square it, you just get the original matrix back. And that's the general standard property of a projection matrix. So in other words, we say we say this is a bona fide projection matrix. Okay, the coarse grid Ritz projection, coarse grid Ritz projection matrix is really a bona fide, tried and true. Bona fide means a uh, good and faithful projection matrix. But we have to have A0 being the satisfying the Glurkin condition for this to be true. So let's multiply pi one tilde times pi one tilde and see what we get. Well, there's pi one tilde and there's another copy of pi one tilde. But what we're gonna do is throw in the definition of the pi zero matrix. So pi zero is this matrix here, right? And there's where it appears on the other side. And now when we put this together, we notice, well, R0, A1, R0 transpose, or in other words, P, that's the wrap condition. And we said that A0 is defined through the wrap condition, through the Galerkin condition. So that just becomes A0. Now, not A0 inverse, but just exactly A0. Well, I get A0 multiplying either A0 inverse on the left or A0 inverse on the right, doesn't matter, take your pick. One of those two is gonna annihilate this guy in the middle. And all that I'm left with is A0 inverse sitting in this middle. But of course, now I recognize this guy here is just being the pi zero matrix. And I have this extra prolongation out front, right? And that's just the pi one tilde matrix. So. If A0 satisfies the Galerkin condition, then this really is a projection matrix. That turns out to be quite important because projection matrices have really nice properties. And of course, we called it a projection matrix. So, you know, uh, hopefully it does satisfy those properties, but it only does so if A0 satisfies the Galerkin condition. So it turns out this must be an important property for us to try to maintain as well. 
and it turns out it will be. Now, if pi 1 tilde is a projection matrix, then i minus pi 1 tilde is also a projection matrix. In fact, this is a generally true result. If I have uh, p being a projection matrix, and I'm using p here, p should not be confused with the prolongation matrix, just any projection matrix. So if p squared is equal to p, then i minus p squared equals i minus p. In other words, if p is a projection matrix, then i minus p is also a projection matrix. That's true in general. So if the Galerkin condition holds i minus uh, pi 1 tilde, the coarse grid uh, Ritz projection matrix, um, is a projection matrix as well, meaning that if I multiply it times itself, then I get the original matrix back. It's an easy thing to show. In fact, I can show this in general. It just comes from this very general result, and that's very easy to show. So I'll skip it. Um, if the Glurkin condition holds, then uh, I minus pi 1 tilde is a projection matrix. Okay, put that in your pocket. Now, uh, it's going to turn out this. Uh, think about what the smooth. Or think about what the two grid algorithm is and does. So it's composed of three component parts. Um, it's got uh, a pre-smoothing. It's got a coarse grade correction. And it's got the post-smoothing. And so, whenever we calculate the error matrix for this two grid process, in fact, we're going to show that it's a product of three errors. Okay, the error matrix for the two grid algorithm or the two grid method, we're going to show that that is a matrix. And it's just going to be the product of three error um, matrices. Okay, The first one is the pre-smoothing error matrix. The second one is going to be the coarse grid correction error matrix. And then the last one is going to be the post-smoothing error transfer matrix. Now, what does the error transfer matrix look like for the general linear iterative scheme to begin with? So for the general linear iterative scheme defined by the iterator matrix B, then we said the error transfer matrix was I minus B A. Okay, now we're no longer gonna use the terminology T because that's gonna mean something else for us in multigrid language. Furthermore, we don't use B for iterator, we use now S for iterator because that's going to be evocative of something called smoothing. And so it's going to turn out very easy to see that the error transfer matrix for this GLIS defined by the smoother, where B is equal to S1, then that's going to be a matrix which is going to be I minus S1 times A. So let's give that a name because it's going to keep appearing. That's the pre-smoothing error transfer matrix. And it's called pre-smoothing because it involves S1. Now, if it was post-smoothing, it would involve S1 transpose, okay? Because the iterator matrix there is S1 transpose, not S1. And again, I said, we don't use T anymore because that is a, a sort of a reserved uh, symbol in multigrid language. We're gonna use the, the matrix K for our error transfer matrix. Okay, so the pre-smoothing error transfer matrix is defined like this. And of course, you can imagine the, the post-smoothing one is, is defined similarly, but where this, is, uh, this iterator is S1 transpose and not S1. All right, now I'm going to define a few inner products that we're going to see um, appearing all the time. And... Uh, and uh, so I have to make a couple of things distinct. First of all, I've got multiple grids laying around. And by multiple grids, I simply mean, am I in this space, Rn1, or am I in this space, Rn0? And of course, you can say to yourself, those have nothing to do whatsoever with grids. And I agree with you, they don't. They're just, uh, they're just uh, real vector spaces. They're, in fact, they're the n-tuples. There's no grids here, but I'm going to cheat and I'm going to call this one the fine grid and this one I'm going to call the coarse grid. All right. So now I can define inner products on either the, the fine grid or the coarse grid or even both. 
So the first thing I want to do is define what I mean by the level one inner product. And just to make sure that everyone understands what grid we're working on, we're going to put a subscript one whenever we're dealing with the fine grid version of it. So suppose I have any U1 and V1 um, in, um, in Rn1, then I'm going to define the, the fine grid um, inner product as this is actually, I don't like this notation actually, even though it's completely true. How should this be defined? You can say so if you, if you, if you don't mind your audio being shared, but um, otherwise I'll just say it. How should that be defined? I really prefer to define it like this. You take the second one, you transpose it, and you multiply it by the first. And of course, th these are the same objects because we're in real land, not in complex land, but um, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's better if we do it this way. Now, um, so that's clear that that's operating on level one because the vectors that we're combining are from the fine grid or the level one grid. Now let's define something called the level one adjoint of any matrix. So if a matrix is square N1 by N1, then we can define the level one adjoint as being that matrix that satisfies um, if I start with it here, it ends up on the other side, but with a transpose. And of course, this level one adjoint is nothing more than just the transpose. This is a standard transpose, and that's because we're using the Euclidean inner product. Okay, We're using the Euclidean inner product, so the transpose is the adjoint. We say that M is level one self-adjoint, or in other words, level one symmetric, if and only if it's equal to its own transpose. And of course, you know, there's nothing really new. There's no content here. I'm really just defining a couple of, um, I'm, I'm really just want us to be clear when we're working with this level one inner product, okay, then we need to have a square matrix, which has N1 rows, N1 columns, and, and et cetera. And I'm hammering home this concept that uh, self-adjoint really means the same as symmetric, but only if we're in um, the Euclidean context. Now, um, let's define something that um, also kind of makes sense, uh, namely this uh, A1 inner product. This also is going to act on a grid uh, on the on the fine grid or level one grid, and this one is defined as as usual. Um, the A1 inner product of U1 and V1 is just you just put an A1 on this first guy here and multiply it by this V1. And we use the uh, level one standard Euclidean inner product to do this. And of course, this comes out to be nothing more or less than V1 transpose A1 U1, right? According to our definition. Now, here's where things get a little bit more interesting. So the A1 adjoint of a matrix M is the unique matrix M star. So don't confuse this with uh, conjugate transpose. This is, um, oh, we mean the, the adjoint in the A1 inner product. So we could, you know, we could have defined this in a couple of ways, but we're going to reserve star to be an adjoint with respect to some stiffness matrix, generally speaking. And that's going to be the unique matrix that satisfies that if I move this matrix over to this side in this inner product, it's going to change by the addition of the star. So it won't be the same as the thing we started out with, unless it turns out to be self-adjoint. And in that case, we say that happens whenever M is equal to M star. We say that that M matrix is A1 self-adjoint or A1 symmetric. And finally, we say that M is A1 symmetric positive definite, if and only if it's A1 symmetric, and it has to satisfy this positivity property for all U1, which are not equal to the zero vector. So all fairly standard stuff. It's just now we're, we're getting into level one differences of inner products. So we could have, of course, level zero versions of these same things, but they tend not to be as um, ubiquitous until we get over into the multigrid section where we're going to see, we're going to see inner products on all possible levels. Um, that's what multigrid is. It's a, it's something comprised of many levels.
Okay, now, um, so that out of the way, um, then I can show the following thing. So suppose that K1 is the pre-smoothing error transfer matrix, right? So that guy is K1 is equal to how we define that is as I1, S1 times A1. Then it turns out that the, um, that the adjoint of K1 matrix, right? What was the adjoint? It's the adjoint with respect to the A1 matrix is just equal to this, I1 minus S1 transpose times A1. So the proof isn't, isn't too hard. We're just gonna use the definition. So suppose that U1 and V1 are arbitrary vectors from Rn1. And let's start with it over here on the left-hand side against U1. And we're gonna try to bit by bit move it over to the right-hand side. So let's see if that can be done. Well, by definition, remember we take this A1 matrix and we attach it to this first vector. So the first vector is everything here. All right, and um, so we can multiply through and that becomes V1 transpose A1 I minus S1 A1 U1. All right, now, um, so we can rewrite this. It's not hard to see by, well, another way of seeing it is we could take this whole thing and transfer it over to the other side of this inner product. And what happens when we do that is it picks up a transpose, right? A, a usual Euclidean transpose. Um, and so, well, when, when I do that, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna transpose, but then I'm gonna multiply or reverse the order of multiplication. So that when I move it to the other side, just I get this transpose times that transpose. Now I keep in mind that A1 transpose is just equal to A1 because A1 is symmetric positive definite to begin with, okay? And then I can carry through this transpose by using the product of, or, or properties of transposes. So the transpose of the sum is just the sum of transposes. And then the product of transposes is the product of transposes, but in reverse order. And so I just get this. And of course, I recognize this already uh, is just A1 because it's uh, it's uh, it's symmetric to begin with. And I can use the symmetry of A1 again to get this guy here. All right, and then I can multiply through by this A1. Okay, so it's gonna attach an A1 there and one there as well. And then I can pull that factor of A1 out, okay? And then I can move that guy back over there. Remember, it's symmetric. So when it goes back over, it's going to gain a transpose, but A1 is just equal to its own transpose. So it goes back over without a transposition. And, and so I'm left with this guy on the right-hand side. And now I can pull this guy back out in the definition of the A1 inner product. And what I'm left with is this guy, but moved over to the right-hand side. And the only thing it did, the only way it changed in going from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side is S1 gained a transposition. And so this says that the adjoint of this operator, this matrix in the A1 inner product is just equal to this matrix, right? This was K1, and so this was K1. This whole thing is K1. And so this thing here must be K1 star because that's how we define the adjoint. And that proves the result. Okay, so let's get into the last section of chapter two. So we're gonna to try to compute the uh, error transfer matrix of this two grid operator. And as I said before, this is gonna involve the product of error transfer matrices or error transfer like matrices uh, owing to pre-smoothing, post-smoothing, and then right in the middle is gonna be the coarse grid correction. So try to try to 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 show you how that's how that works so i claim we have all the tools we need to try to identify this and so this whole chapter is a short chapter the previous chapter i think was six or seven sections long this one's only three and i wanted to make it short and sweet because i just wanted to find some notation in here and sometimes having a nice little short chapter is good just to get notation 
um, identified and out of the way. So here it is. Here's the here's the theorem for the two grid algorithm defined earlier. Then we can show that the error is transferred like this, and so therefore we have an error transfer matrix. Um, the error is transferred from from uh, iteration level k to iteration level k plus one simply by the multiplication of of this matrix here, and therefore we're going to call that the error transfer matrix for the two grid algorithm. And it is the product of uh, K1 star. Remember the K1 star is the A1 adjoint of K1 raised to the M2 power. Now, why do you suppose it's M2 power? Well, it's M2 power because we're doing M2 steps of post smoothing. If we do zero steps of post smoothing, and we will actually do that later on. That's going to be completely gone because it's going to be M2 is going to be a zero. And so raise anything to zero power, you just get the identity. Times I1 minus pi one tilde. So this turns out to be what we call the error in the course grid correction stage. And then finally times K1 raised to the M1 power. So this is our pre-smoothing error stage. So the idea is at each stage, we wanted to, to, to decrease the error, to, to push the error down. So smoothing is gonna push the error, error down in a certain way. And the coarse grid correction is then gonna take over and push the error down in a certain way. And then finally, post smoothing is gonna decrease the error in a certain way. So the combination of these error reduction techniques hopefully is going to lead to convergence. So we wanna prove this. Now, this really is the error, okay? That's the error at the kth plus first stage, and this is the error at the kth stage. And uh, that is to say the difference between the exact solution and the current iterant. Um, and this exact solution, of course, is, is solving uh, this problem. Now, here's a harder problem to show. Um, so it's easy enough, it turns out, to compute this two grid tra error transfer matrix. But what's harder to show is that actually this two grid algorithm is really just a general linear iterative scheme. And therefore, what that means is we can find an iterator matrix, what we'll call the overall iterator matrix, not just the one that's involved in pre-smoothing or post-smoothing, but the grand iterator matrix B1, such that our error transfer matrix can be written as I minus B1, A1. In other words, as it would normally be done if this was a general linear iterative scheme. So there are a couple of ways of proving this part here. I'm gonna leave that as an exercise. It's a rather uh, challenging problem. And I wanna see who can do that, okay? I wanna see who stands out in the crowd and who can figure out what this B1 is. I have an idea who uh, those people will be, but I want to see who can figure out what, what is it my B, standard B1. All right, now this one is an easier problem. And again, we're not using a T matrix for the error transfer matrix. We're using this, this thing called E. So let's see if we can do this. Let's see if we can prove this. So um, I can do this if I can do this in three stages, right? And so I take each one of the stages of, so basically when I move from, when I apply uh, the, when I apply the two grid algorithm, there's gonna be error at three different stages. There's the initial error, I guess four. There's the initial error, error after stage one, error after stage two, and then finally error after stage three. And the error after stage three is going to essentially be the error of the whole, uh, two grid iteration process after doing one single iteration. So that's how we're gonna break it down. So this here means the error or the, 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 the computed solution after stage one and um, stage two, stage three, right? So I equals one, two, and three. Um, right, so let's get into that. So the error after the pre-smoothing step, what is that going to be? Well, it's not too hard to see what this should be because we already know what is the error after doing a general linear iterative process, a general linear iterative scheme. The error after doing M1 stages or M1 steps of the general linear iterative scheme should be the error transfer matrix for that general linear iterative process, 
raised to the m1 power. So you start off with this guy here, e1k, you apply m1 steps of the pre-smoother, and that's going to generate or convert your error to be equal to this guy, right? k1m1 times e1k. Does everyone see how that's done? It's kind of a simple thing, but looks like I'm raising my hand. Oh, that is such a cool feature. Automatic hand raising. Um, so it may seem complicated or simple to you. I claim that this is what we did or took care of in, in uh, chapter one. Okay, it's just uh, the, the, the error or the error transfer matrix raised to the, K, to the M1 pow power after doing M1 steps of the pre-smoothing. Okay, and so at the end of the pre-smoothing stage, we have N1, E1, 1 is just K1, M1, E1, K. All right, so let's go on to the course grid correction step. So how would we define the error after the course grid correction step? Well, that would be the true solution minus the iterate after the course grid correction step. So let's fill in what is this guy in total. So U12, well, that was defined as U11 plus we prolongated or we pushed the course grid correction from the course grid up to the fine grid. So it's that plus that. And of course, I have a minus sign, which distributes across. So I just get that. Okay, no problem there. Now I can combine these two things together. And of course, that's just E11. That's the error after uh, stage one. But what about this process? What about this guy here? Well, now I'm going to fill in what exactly is that course grid correction. It's just A0 inverse times R01. Okay. Now let's fill in what, what does this residual look like or this thing like the residual on the coarse grid? Well, remember that was just the restriction of the fine grid residual, right? So push that or, or, or pop, pop that in there. And so now we have R0 transpose times A0 inverse R0, R11. Now remember um, R1 and E1 satisfy the error equation, right? So we know that A1, E1, 1 is just equal to R11, okay? So now I'm going to pop that guy in there here. That just becomes that. All right, now let's recognize what this thing is. That is just the pi 1 tilde operator, All right? So we have E11 minus pi 1 tilde times E11. So that's I1 minus pi 1 tilde times E11, okay? So that's the, uh, this is something we recognize, right? This was, we know that this is a, a projection um, because, well, we, we know it's a projection as long as A0 satisfies the Galerkin condition. But otherwise, this is just going to be the error in applying the coarse grid correction. Okay, error in coarse grid correction. All right, but notice that I'm relating now E12 to E11. And I already have a relationship for E11. That's just K1M1 times E1K. So I can take that and I can put it down here now. Now, the, next, the, the, the last thing is, and that's, of course, what I've just done here. The last thing to do is to compute uh, the error after the last stage, which is the post-smoothing stage. Well, we know what that looks like as well, because that's just a general linear iterative scheme. I minus S1 transpose. Why S1 transpose? Because remember, we use the S1 transpose matrix in our post-smoothing step. All right. But this whole matrix here is what we call K1 star, right? It's the adjoint of the K1 operator in the A1 uh, inner product. Okay, that gets raised to the M2 power because we do M2 steps or uh, so we usually call these sweeps in multigrid literature. So we do M2 sweeps of this post smoothing step. So that's where that power comes from. And that, of course, is acting on whatever error was currently there. And that's the error after stage two. So now I can take this formula and pop it into there. And so that proves 
exactly what I wanted to prove. The error at, at uh, K1, remember K1 is just the thing we get after the third stage, or sorry, K1 plus one. Not K1 plus one, just K plus one. K plus one is what we get after applying that th third stage. So the error after the third stage is really the error at level K plus one. If I put everything together, it's clear that this bit is my error transfer matrix. It's a product of three matrices, right? Post-smoothing, quartz grid correction, and pre-smoothing. And that's it. Now, as I said, the second part is a lot harder, showing that this error transfer matrix can be written as I1 minus B1 times A1. Okay, so that's a lot harder. Um, if you have a candidate, though, you can probably apply something like an induction step to show it, um, and I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Now, I will say I worked it out um, in the case that M1 and M2 are, are just equal to 1. I'll show you what the result is. It actually is fairly uh, complicated, but it comes in a set effectively two stages. And the two stages are as follows. You get something which just involves smoothing. And so I call that a symmetric smoothing stage. So B1 has a symmetric smoothing part. And then it has a part which looks like this. And this one is I'm calling it, I'm calling this one the coarse grid correction part because this bit here looks like a coarse grid correction. All right, so this is only for the case where M1 is, is, is equal to M2. You get the error or sort of the iterator matrix coming in two stages effectively of smoothing purely and then a coarse grid correction. Okay, so um, and we can show, and I'm not showing it here, but you can show that B1 is always going to be symmetric uh, in the Euclidean sense if and only if M1 is equal to M2 Okay, which I can call the common value L. All right, so that's what we call a symmetric two grid algorithm, symmetric two grid algorithm. But otherwise, I'm not saying what um, that iterator matrix looks like. In fact, I'll just be honest with you. I don't know what, what the formula is or whether it can be found in any uh, simple way, but I have um, looking at other textbooks. Uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that that's true. It's just, I don't, I don't know what the formula is. So maybe one of you guys, uh, one of you incredible students can find out what that is. The final thing I want to talk about uh, before uh, we end for today is I want to show that that error transfer matrix for the two grid algorithm is symmetric with respect to the A1 inner product, if and only if M1 and M2 are equal, so that's what we call the symmetric two-grid case. And furthermore, if we have M1 equals M2, the symmetric case, and if the Glurkin condition also holds, then it turns out that E1 is symmetric positive semi-definite with respect to that A1 inner product. Okay, So it's symmetric with respect to the A1 inner product, if and only if uh, M1 equals M2, and it's symmetric positive definite in that case, or sorry, positive semi-definite in that case. All right, so this is uh, two steps we want to show, the symmetry and the non-negativity. So let's get into it. What about the symmetry? So to show this, we need to show that when we move this guy to the other side, of course, it naturally gains an E1 star. But what we want to show is that that E1 star is just equal to E1. Okay, symmetric with respect to A1. All right, so there is my, there's my uh, error transfer operator. And I'm doing this in the A1 norm. Now, what do we know about this guy here? Well, this guy is already the product of, of uh, a bunch of adjoint matrices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those guys and I'm going to move them over one at a time to this side going to move one adjoint over the next adjoint. What happens when I move this adjoint matrix over in the A1 inner product? Well, it goes over, but without an adjoint. 
Okay, so the adjoint disappears because I'm moving it to the other side in the A1 inner product. So I move over one, then another, then another, then another. And at the end of the day, I get K1 uh, raised to the M2 power, all moved over and all without the adjoint. Okay, so what's the, what's the next step? I'm going to take this guy and move it over. And when I do, it gets an adjoint, a star. And then finally, I'm going to move these guys over. And every time I do, they gain a star because I have to take the adjoint. Okay, now it's something that I didn't show, but it's adjoint. Let me write it in general terms. The adjoint of the adjoint is the thing back. Okay, so I, I am using that property, very easy property to show. So I hope you see that as I move these things over, that's exactly what I get. Now, um, we want to observe the important property here that when I take the adjoint of this, um, the sum of two matrices, then I just get the thing back. In fact, what this says is that this whole thing is self-adjoint. Okay, so how, how would I show that? So the calculation of showing that is here. So I'm going to, for the sake of brevity, skip that. Okay, so um, that that's carried out here. And it uses the fact that we're using the Galerkin condition for the A0 operator. Okay, so I'm going to skip that. Um, so that's the showing that this pi one uh, tilde matrix is self-adjoint in the A1 inner product. Um, it's going to show ultimately that the error I1 minus pi one tilde is self-adjoint in the A1 inner product. Okay, so symmetry then follows as long as um, this thing is going to look exactly like the original thing, as long as M1 and M2 are the same. And of course, they are by assumption, so we're done. Okay, so having skipped that step, um, we should be good. Now, the last thing I want to show is that we have positive semi-definiteness. And here, we're going to use the fact that I1 minus pi1 tilde is a projection matrix. Okay, And that holds true as long as the Galerkin condition, Galerkin condition holds. So we want to show that this thing works out to be something which is positive semi-definite. Okay, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to automatically assume, start by assuming that M1 and M2 are the same. I'm going to move these guys over, and they lose their stars when we move them over. And then I'm going to use the fact that this is a projection matrix. In other words, that this matrix is equal to the original thing times itself. And then I'm going to use the fact that I know that this is one of these guys. That's all I need is one, is self-adjoint. When I move it over, it gets a star, but the star goes away because I have self-adjointness. But now look, I have in the A inner product, I have the same um, vector appearing on the left as on the right. And so that means that's the norm of that vector squared. And all I need to do is conclude that this guy is, is uh, non-negative, which it is because this is a norm squared. Okay, so that's the end of the proof. Now, I will say that no matter what, this guy could be non-zero and this guy still be zero. So I can't say that it's positive definite. Can't say positive definite, but it is going to be positive semi-definite. Okay, so that's where we're ending today's lecture. Uh, we we talked about the components of the two-grid algorithm. We talked about the coarse grid risk projection. And then finally, we constructed the error transfer matrix for this uh, two-grid method. And we showed that it has certain nice properties.